Okay, assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me and see uh, the, the things that I am sharing with you? Yes, Doctor. Yes. Okay. All right, then we shall start the, the class and the timing might not be uh, at 2.30, it depends. It might be at 2, okay, but today I have something uh, else to do. All right, then, okay. Let's start with the uh, course information. I just share with you the latest uh, CI. The, the previous one that I shared with you was the wrong one. Uh, it is supposed to be SKAB4113. So this is the right one, SKAB4113. Okay, now let's go to uh, straight to the uh, course uh, learning outcome. We do have uh, three course learning outcome, namely CLO1, so CLO1, at the end of this semester, or not even at the end of this semester, in fact, a few weeks after we start our class, uh, you should be able to explain the principal process, principal process and issue in managing construction project. If I ask you right now, uh, how do you define uh, project management, construction management? Okay, for instance, in our topic, there are two items being mentioned here, construction and project management, meaning to say there are two different things. And can you define construction management or even can you define project management? What are the process involved in managing construction project? And then what could be the issues? You have done your practical training. The purpose of having practical training at the third year is basically for you to learn uh, what's going on in the industry and then bring them back to uh, uh, to the university or to finish up your study in order for you to understand more. So what is basically going on? In university, because the timing, the, the, the learning period is very short, for sure we are not going to give you everything. So most of the thing that you uh, learn in the industry will be a new things later on, okay? But the principle are there. Okay, so that would be uh, the CLO1. At the end of uh, this semester, we expect you to be able to explain those process. If, for instance, I give you a quiz right now, I'm sure perhaps uh, three quarter of the class would not be able to answer correctly. Okay, so that is the purpose of learning, to learn a new thing. And CLO1, where does basically we put into our uh, weekly topic? So CLO1 would be uh, put into week one until week number three. Okay, so if you notice week one, week two, and then week three, it's all basically these things are basically related to or being grouped together as a CLO1. Okay, so you will learn a few topics. So today we start with the overview of construction industry and then followed by current issues. And then perhaps uh, next week we are going to go into project management uh, principles. And then subsequently we are going to go into project development process, project. Uh, professional responsibility, project manager, and then uh, by the third week, uh, we are going to complete uh, perhaps project manager partially and then uh, organizational function of uh, organization. So if you learn those things, then we did a so-called uh, quiz, test, whatever, you should be able to explain, okay, the concept, if you are able to explain the concept, meaning to say we have achieved the KPI of this CLO. And how are we going to assess you uh, for this CLO1? Okay. After you complete learning uh, topics uh, in week one until three, we are going to release test number one. So test number one is not going to be in the middle of the semester. By right, after we complete or uh, you complete uh, 
learning week number one and uh, uh, three, okay, um, we might not be able to, I'm not really sure because the, uh, Diwali is coming, okay, perhaps we can cover those uh, three weeks, the first three weeks. Okay, then I will uh, inform about test number one. So test number one might not be in the middle of the semester uh, because it only cover CLO1. Okay, worth 10% of your grade. Okay, that will be one thing. And then you, uh, there is, you might notice a case study. Case study. Okay, if we go back to uh, the whole, okay, week number 14 and 15 at the end of the semester, we are supposed to have a case study actually. Okay, what is case study? Case study is where uh, you are given uh, some kind of case based on written case. There are many written cases in uh, in the internet, for instance, which basically might um, might discuss uh, anything about management, okay, or anything about issue in the construction industry, whatever. Uh, then uh, we we'll get together, and then uh, you are going to be uh, asked question after question. If, for instance, you are able to, to answer the question, you will score some marks. That is what case study is all about. Instead of me talking uh, all the time, now the other, way, the other way around, okay? So that will be 5%. But uh, due to these uh, online things, we might not be able. So normally, if we are doing face-to-face, -face, so the last week, we are going to alloc allocate the, those time uh, for the case study, so it is uh, just nice. Uh, you have complete learning everything, actually. Case study, even though we uh, we attach to a CLO1, but uh, everything that you, you study can be used uh, uh, to answer all the questions related to project management because they are interrelated anyway, okay? But because of the COVID situation, we might not be able to do that because it's very difficult to do online, these kind of things. We might uh, substitute those case study with what we call a quiz. Okay, we might substitute with what we call quiz. Okay, normally we are going to have an online quiz. Perhaps by next week, uh, you should be able to answer online quiz based on whatever things that you uh, learn today. For instance, that could be uh, used to substitute the case study. Okay, that would be 5%. And then lastly, F. F is what we call final exam. Okay, final exam uh, going to be conducted this semester during the uh, exam week. So, some of the question would be coming from CLO1. So we allocate about 15% of the marks uh, from uh, CLO1. So if, for instance, you already learn in, uh, during the first three weeks and you already read uh, in order to be tested or quizzes before, so you should not be able to have a problem in answering final exam question because it is things that you already learned, except that you might not remember. Okay, that is very common. Okay, that will be C, uh, for the CLO1. Then remember CLO1 is basically for week number one until number three here. And then we go into week numbers four. Okay, this one, four until, where is it? Until uh, week number nine. Okay, so a big portion of our class in the middle of the, uh, the semester from week number four and then encroach into after semester break perhaps because uh, it depends on how fast we can go. This is basically dedicated in, into CLO2. So what is CLO2? So CLO2 is about planning and scheduling, okay? Project planning and scheduling. Scheduling is the keyword. So you basically learn uh, the concept first. What are the various scheduling techniques, uh, gun chart, uh, network diagram, 
and then we do have CPM, uh, arrow diagram, uh, what else? Uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, activity or not diagram, PDM diagram, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So each of the method basically do have some kind of calculation, and at the end of the day, you must be you must be able to develop the project scheduling based on whatever method that we learn. Okay. So that is a big portion because uh, it comes with the calculation. And you know what? Mm, uh, I would say maybe 50 to 55% or even 60% of our class involve calculation. Where does calculation coming from? Calculation would be coming from CLO2 and then subsequently CL, CLO3. Okay. So don't expect this class is a reading only things. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, the first three weeks, yes, but the rest would involve some kind of calculation. Okay. So that will be CLO2. And in fact, our class is uh, the core, the core subject is about planning and scheduling. Because from this planning scheduling, we are going to use into uh, resource management. Resource management. Last time, during the previous uh, student curriculum, SKAA, uh, in IDP3, they do have what we call project scheduling as one of their project. Uh, so whatever thing that they learn in this class will be used in order to, uh, to develop project scheduling in IDP3. But we have scrapped those things. Uh, uh, from IDP3, and then we we bring back to this class. You know why? Because in IDP3, as you would basically know, the project are being divided into a few uh, person in charge, and only that person in charge would basically uh, uh, know uh, about that particular topic. The rest of the topic, the rest of the project, he or she basically don't care. That basically defeat the purpose. By right, when you take up uh, a course, you should be able to know everything inside the course. That is the, the the purpose of learning. It is not just knowing only a little bit of a, a particular thing, and then the rest you let your friend do without even uh, bother to ask or to learn. That basically uh, defeat the purpose of learning. Okay, so project scheduling. Uh, if you notice at the end of the uh, project scheduling, uh, here it here, maybe in week number nine, we are going to have a hands-on session. And again, unfortunately, during COVID, we cannot go to the computer lab. And normally, we would like to go to the computer lab to show you step-by-step uh, -step, uh, things. So we are just simply going to to, to do this thing, uh, I will demonstrate, okay, uh, online, but then you have to basically uh, duplicate whatever things that I basically show as a demonstration, and then you need to submit, and those things will contribute to uh, what we call homework or project, certain portion of the project, okay? And then, uh, at the end of the semester, uh, planning scheduling will be part of the final exam. So meaning to say when it is part of the final exam, uh, you are going to expect the theoretical aspect of planning scheduling plus the calculation aspect, okay? Uh, during two and a half hours of final exam. Okay, so after you learn uh, this thing, so I would say this is from week number four until week number nine. Uh, uh, deducting the uh, semester break for sure. Okay, lastly, after you learn planning scheduling, then only you will use that knowledge in order to, to solve or apply in resource management. So CLO3, I would uh, basically use the keyword as resource management, resource management in order to remember it. Resource management. This is basically planning, CLO2 is planning scheduling, whereas uh, CLO1 is basically uh, the principle of uh, uh, project or construction management. 
Okay, so CLO3 would be everything that you learn uh, after we completed the hands-on hands session on planning scheduling. Uh, it will cover a few topics such as labor resource management, and then plan and machineries, project time, uh, cost trade-off, and then project cash flow, and lastly, project monitoring and control. So it is quite a big, uh, big, uh, what we call topic to cover as well. So that's why we give you a big portion of the mark or so from this part. And this part, we are going to test you so we have test number two. So test number two is going to cover CLO2 only. And then we are also going to have homework in order for you to, to do, uh, to, to, to basically uh, understand the concept of cash flow, especially that is a big thing, or even uh, project crashing. And lastly, for sure, final exam will also have uh, portion of this uh, topic okay so that is uh, you can take a look at the breakdown of uh, what we call marks here so 50 50 percent will be uh, final exam which basically cover everything clo1 and to clo3 uh, whereas the test uh, tests do not cover all the clo the first test will cover clo1 whereas the second test will cover the last portion of uh, learning resource management, whereas uh, for planning scheduling, we normally do uh, project or homework, okay, in order to for you to basically to test your understanding on the subject matter. Okay, that would be the CLO1. So, so far, any question on CLO1? Any question on CLO1? So if there is no question, let me start the class uh, by going through the first slide. Okay, I do not share the information inside the e-learning yet. So WhatsApp group will be the best or the, the quickest way to get all the information. So whatever thing that I share with you, please download and save into whatever uh, folder inside your computer because it might not be uh, available uh, throughout the uh, the semester because you never know. Okay, sometimes the file might get deleted. All right, now let's go into our first uh, slide. Okay. All right, let me make it bigger. Okay, overview of the construction industry especially in Malaysia. So if you are from any other country, so you should basically know or read more about your construction industry. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you are into the civil engineering, meaning to say this is your industry, whether you like it or not, this is the industry that you are going to stay on until the end of your life. You might uh, basically die eh, during work you never know okay when you work at the construction site you might get uh, get hit by the crane okay so so the entire life will basically depend on the construction industry if for instance you you work in malaysia if you work in the government government do have the pension period until the age of 60 okay that will be fine but if you work in the private sector they don't care Okay, they don't don't really have the uh, uh, pension period. You can work until uh, 75, 90, whatever thing that you like, and, uh, as long as people uh, like your service, or even you might be the owner of the, the company. Okay, you can work forever. All right. Why we need to know about construction industry? Because inside this construction industry, where issue and challenges uh, are there, Okay, so those issues and challenges will be part and parcel of our life. Either we are the one that, that create the issue or there could be the other people who basically trying very hard in order to solve the challenges. Okay, 
So you could be the culprit or you could be the uh, solution provider. Example. You know what? Construction industry is a uh, very well known uh, uh, prone to what we call corruption, ethical issue. Anywhere, anywhere you go in the world, you can read from Transparency International website. Construction industry is always one of the uh, the industry where basically we do face this issue compared to other industry. Why? There could be many reasons due to the nature of the construction industry, due to the complexity, due to the, due to the process, due to many authority involved, due to uh, what we call phases of the construction industry, due to the nature of the uh, pricing, pricing might not be very open. So everything. So that basically create the situation. And when you work, you could be the culprit because you are the one that basically taking all the the bribe and whatnot, and basically it damaged the reputation of this industry. And people who basically try to 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 work uh, according to the work ethic, they got the blame as well. See, that is the issue. Basic nature: the industry stakeholders type the construction main process and issue and challenges. So issue and challenges, I put it into a uh, lecture number two because it is a big thing that we. Um, we want to discuss, and once you discuss uh, this, the slide number two, it basically answer some part of the CLO1. You see, if you understand these two slides plus the project management principle, you would basically understand the CLO1 already. No need to wait until the end of the uh, third week. You would know. Okay, industry sector. Sector meaning to say within construction industry. So construction industry actually is a big sector of the economy. Say so let's say this is economy, and when you divide the economy into a small small portion, into this pie chart, so construction would basically would be here. And then we do have many many things manufacturing. We do have uh, tourism industry, oil and mining industry, oil and gas, service industry, etc., etc., agriculture. So, construction industry is one of the economic sector. But inside the construction itself, we do have a few sectors. We need to say a few sections, namely residential, commercial, infrastructure, and industrial, uh, to name a few, because uh, Sometimes they are being grouped according to what we call a, a sector or the nature of the contract. Residential. Residential is basically where uh, we see um, housing industry. Okay, housing industry where people live. People do not live in the office. So office basically we call it commercial. People do not live in the mall. Okay. But nowadays, uh, due to the scarcity of the land in the urban area, you know what? There is a, what we call a SOHO, S-O-H-O. So SOHO basically is a combination of residential plus the office. Ah, that is a new concept because uh, sometimes uh, people build residential very far away from the office and then they need to commute, which might not be... Uh, practical and in fact nowadays there are a lot of uh, office which basically do not require a lot of people people can work at home the office is just uh, for the sake of people coming for uh, discussion whereby everything you can do it uh, almost uh, relatively alone and a few staff might be working at home for instance so it's a combination of office plus uh, home this is where basically you stay and then uh, you basically work. Okay, that is basically a trend nowadays. But previously, there is a separation, very clear separation between residential and commercial building. So it, regardless of what type of residential, whether you live in a bungalow, it might cost you 10 million, uh, you might live uh, in a uh, low cost of flat houses, doesn't matter. So all those things we call it residential. And then, so residential is a big, big uh, business. 
because once there are people, then people need to, to, to stay somewhere. So basically, there is a demand for residential. But during COVID, because of um, a lot of jobs have been cut, so we do have uh, abundant uh, number of houses, uh, housing unit, uh, basically unsold, okay, everywhere in Malaysia or everywhere in the world as well. Commercial building. When you go to, uh, for instance, Taman University, if you have been to Taman University for sure, uh, there are many shop lot. There are even Eon, there are even U Mall. So those things are what we call residential. So where business uh, are, are there, okay? Business are there. And then infrastructure and heavy engineering, where basically you, you can see airport, dam, bridges, road, highway, and what else? Um, railway. So those things can be categorized as this uh, category. Previously, civil engineering was known for this type of uh, project, actually. But then nowadays, civil engineering do cover many, many, many different areas, including uh, environment, even project management. Okay, Previously, project management was not part of the so-called civil engineering. Then later on, uh, when they realized that without the knowledge of uh, project management, the project has been running out of late, and then the cost basically go beyond what they basically budgeted, and then this basically knowledge start to basically uh, gaining attention. And then lastly, industrial. What is industrial? Industrial is basically all the factory. Okay. It could be small, big, medium, or big, big factory as uh, we normally put in the uh, near airport, near port. In, for instance, in Johor, we do have Pasir Gudang full of industry, and then uh, Senai Airport also full of all kind of factories. And then when the land are getting uh, limited there, then they encroach into different different areas. So we have we do have Senai Technological Park. And even some of the small, small factory encroach into residential. In Malaysia, in residential area, we do have factory. If you go overseas, for instance, Australia, UK, US, so they do separate between residential and then uh, industry. But what to do in Malaysia, we put everything together. Okay, So that is not a good uh, urban planning anyway. But if you go to, to a city like Putrajaya, it is a well planned. Uh, you can see uh, no factory in the, uh, within the residential area. That would be very clear. Okay. All right. Then, basic nature of the construction industry. Why you need to know construction industry that you will basically stay until the rest of your life? Because you need to understand. Uh, what could be the problem associated with the industry? So you could be part of the, again I say, part of the problem or you could be part of the solution. As engineer, we are being designed to be a, a problem solver. That is what basically our discipline is all about. We learn four years in university uh, about problem solving because that is what engineering is all about. So you do not want to to be the other side of the coin, whereas instead of uh, trying to provide solution, now you are a part of the problem because of the work ethic, etc., etc. Okay, first thing, basic nature of the construction industry, diverse participant, meaning to say there are many people involved, not only one party. So this is what we call uh, stakeholders. Stakeholders. Then, very important sector of the economy. I already show you, construction is one of the sector. And if it is, this is the pie chart, we can divide this uh, chart into percentage. And what do you think, construction industry? What is the percentage of construction industry compared to the, uh, the other industry uh, contribution? Manufacturing, for instance. If you understand our economy is made up of uh, what kind of industry, perhaps you will get some idea. Okay, but if you never bother, 
only now uh, you, you you are going to understand a little bit about what we call construction economy okay then you understand how important is this industry and uh, how basically this industry will influence the economy so i mentioned very important so if it is very important maybe inside our idea we would say uh, if you we take a look at this portion maybe if it is important so a big percentage of the construction uh, work will contribute to, to the economy maybe big percentage i don't know maybe 30 percent 30 percent is a big percentage okay that could be the the values if i mentioned very important but wait until the end of the slide then you understand uh, it might not be necessarily big in numbers, okay? So there are uh, the other meaning behind this. The demand for the construction industry depend on uh, other industry growth. Is it true or not? Okay, construction industry basically depend on other industry. Is it correct? Then government play significant role. Is it true that government plays a significant role and uh, that basically decide whether the construction industry uh, is sluggish or booming? Then engage transient workforce. The workforce that change, people come and go. Is it really true? Okay. Perhaps if you work uh, at a construction site during your practical training, you would basically understand some of this concept that I mentioned, especially this one. Highly competitive industry. Uh, perhaps you have learned in uh, during the uh, class uh, SKAB 3123 about project estimating and tendering. There are different types of uh, uh, tender, for instance. One of them we call it competitive tendering uh, or open tender. Okay, so when you are in the situation of open tender, you can imagine one project, people, uh, there are many contractors who would like to submit, maybe sometime until 100, uh, what we call submission. So we need to say it is very competitive. We only want to choose one. We only want to choose the best price, it is not the lowest price. So everybody have to compete in order to get a job. It is like a uh, work also. Once you graduate, okay. Once you have you graduate, uh, you just imagine how many people are competing to get a job in Malaysia or even your in your country. And every year or every semester, there are new students coming into the university, for instance. And we are not the only one offering civil engineering. There are many other university. Just imagine, not only government or uh, there could be private sector as well. Okay, so competing. Quality control is very difficult. Is it really true? Quality control is difficult. Well, if you have seen construction work during your practical training, perhaps you would appreciate it is not easy. So construction, it is not an easy, easy work to do, okay? So if you look at the construction work day by day, then basically you would basically uh, uh, feel very pity to the construction workers with low salary, with all the heavy lifting that they need to do, with all kind of risk that they need to encounter, working under hot sun, working under all kind of extreme temperature in perhaps in another country. Just imagine, it is not worth uh, to get that kind of uh, salary. And that basically tell one of the issue why basically people in Malaysia, especially local people do not like to work as construction laborer. And how many percentage of uh, our laborer consists of local or foreign? That will be the issue, okay? So those those are the things that you you need to know or to read to Google. Uh, once you you read this topic, 
It is not just simply look at the slide. Okay, that's it. No, no, no. Because you are the one that's going to work in the construction industry. So you must basically know the nature. Once you understand the nature, then perhaps you would appreciate this industry more. And then you perhaps you basically uh, can come up with the solution instead of make life more difficult to, to, to people who work in the construction industry. You try to come up with some kind of solution. That is the, the idea. Okay, and then other issue. We are going to look at those issue in uh, the next slide. Stakeholders, adverse, uh, what we call uh, adverse participant. Adverse participant means to say there are too many parties involved. We can group them into main stakeholders and secondary stakeholders. Main stakeholders, for sure we need client. Client owner or owner. We can divide into public sector and private sector. Main contractor, for sure, we need main contractor because tender normally being awarded to main contractor and subsequently contractor would, would basically get uh, all kind of subcontractor to work with them. That is the concept. And then consultant. For sure, we need consultant because uh, con uh, contractor do not do design. Only consultant do design. So before we have anything uh, clear to, to build, basically, so all kind of detailing must be there. So who is going to do that? This is the work of consultant. Then project manager. Okay, now the, the word project manager, don't get confused. If you already uh, work, you already experience working at the construction site, uh, maybe you know project manager. So that project manager, is basically the one that work with contractor. So this project manager is not being referred to the one who basically work with a contractor. This project manager is the one that we refer to the one that work with the owner or client. This is what we call client representative. In Malaysia, we know this guy by the name of project management consultant. You see, they are category, they are being categorized as consultant and their pro profession is being called project manager. Whereas project manager that you know, who is basically the, the boss at the construction site is the one that work with the contractor. So we already have the uh, main contractor, which basically already project manager would basically work with the main contractor anyway. But then this project manager in uh, my slide basically refer to this category. So when project manager as a professional work uh, as a client representative, they do have different uh, area of responsibility, which is not the same as when uh, a project manager work with the consult uh, with the contractor. So if you understand this thing, then perhaps later on you would be able to answer exam question. Exam question, for instance, we do we do ask. Uh, responsibility of project manager working with consultant, uh, with a client. We do have project manager working with contractor. So you must be able to, to distinguish the responsibility between those uh, party. They are not the same, but in terms of profession, they, they are being called project manager. Okay. Then secondary uh, stakeholders, secondary stakeholders, um, uh, authorities, financier, people who basically give loan and who basically need loan or need money uh, in the project setting up, that would be question. Supplier, we need supplier and supplier normally being appointed by uh, contractors. End user, who are being categorized as end user. Okay, and user basically people or the the staff, the workers who basically you will use the facility. Uh, if you can imagine, in Malaysia we do have public work department or J, we call it JKR. JKR is basically government agency, whereby all the government project, government project meaning to say government need to build school, road. Uh, and all kind of facility for the public purposes. Okay, 
So basically, public get all those things free of charge because government uh, is the one that provide based on uh, whatever tax that uh, we pay, basically. So JKR is a government representative. But the building might not belong to JKR. The building might belong to school. So who are the user? The user, basically, the school teacher and administration, and then plus the uh, what we call school children. Uh, that would be categorized as user. So the user basically have say in terms of what are the things that basically they like. And normally, a good design would take into account user input. And oftentimes, you see building, once the building was being handed over to the uh, owner, client, whatever, and then come what we call renovation. The building just completed very nicely or being, uh, being uh, painted very nicely. But then come the contractor, uh, what we call renovation contractor, demolish part of the structure. So you see, that is a form of wastage. Why people demolish? Well, simply because the building being handed over or the, the one that they bought do not meet their requirement. Why can't we just simply have a building whereby it basically meet the user requirement where we don't have to demolish the building right after uh, we get the keys to the building? Maybe a few years after that, okay, that will be fine. You see, lastly, public and NGO. Public and NGO is uh, previously was not being considered as part and parcel, parcel of the project setting up, but nowadays, uh, public and NGO tend to grow in terms of uh, uh, what we call voice, in terms of influence, and when public and NGO get together, uh, basically, a project can be stopped, a project can be even postponed, etc., etc. So that kind of input, which basically uh, started in the West, uh, Western world, but now it, it encroached into many, many other countries. To a certain extent, it could be good also. So, so that the owner or the government do not just simply... Uh, develop project without considering the views of the neighborhood or the public etc etc uh, sometimes they do that because uh, they basically do plan something behind our back because when money involved so we never know what kind of deal they, they do have with certain uh, uh, what we call land owner or what or what not without considering the public so that would be the thing okay construction sector acted as a catalyst to other sector. So this basically, uh, I want to relate to um, my previous slide. Construction industry basically uh, do relate to other industry. And you know what? In some of the publication or reading, uh, people say construction sector can generate 120 other industry. Could be small or big. I just want to, to, to relate to a few industry only in order to prove that construction industry is very important. Okay, first thing first, education. Education falls under the category of service industry because under service industry, uh, they do group a few things together. I think uh, this one, this one, that could be considered as service industry, not only uh, service by itself, but uh, uh, everything. There are many things. That's why in our economy, service contribute around maybe around, if I'm not mistaken, around maybe 60, 50 percent, 50 percent, a big portion. Why? Because there are many, many sub area uh, being put under service industry. OK, education. All right. Why people go to colleges, university, or even uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, small, small colleges uh, that basically offer certificate in certain, certain skill? Well, because of the demand. The demand. People uh, in the industry need 
those uh, those people which basically might have degree might have diploma in Malaysia it is very simple if you have degree then you qualify to be engineer okay so that's why uh, you cannot work as an engineer without any degree it, it is considered as illegal under our law uh, board of engineer Malaysia so that's why after you graduate immediately you have to register with board of engineer then only you can practice as engineer okay uh, you simply cannot uh, practice as engineer even though you already have experience without the without the degree that is basically the requirement just like driving a license uh, driving a car without a license if you are, you get caught then you can be charged so similar concept is that thing and then if you have diploma if you have diploma degree you are eligible to be called a ta technical assistant okay or even supervisor but bear in mind uh, there are a lot of supervisor at the construction site uh, sometimes they do not have a proper diploma that could be okay because uh, in terms of uh, requirement that will, be, will not be strict compared to uh, engineer and then what else if you have certificate so in Malaysia we do have polytechnic which basically offer all kind of certification program so certification is more like hands-on okay they, they do learn a little bit less theory but more on but basically practical so they could they could be uh, considered as what we call a uh, foreman in the construction industry we do have foreman or basically the leader to the group of workers okay and eventually once you are foreman uh, later on you will be promoted into supervisor for instance okay uh, that would be the the the, uh, the line so education is needed in order to fulfill the demand by the industry so that's why you can see many university colleges private sector or government basically uh, being uh, basically uh, bloom due to the high demand if we do have a lot of construction project going on automatically there is a need to, to to establish all kind of vocational school vocational technical school etc etc in order to cater for the demand and remember the example that i'm giving you is basically the plus highway plus highway is basically the north and south highway the main highway in malaysia that run for around i think 1.2000 kilometer from the northern part of Malaysia until Johor okay so this is what we call north south highway we call it plus so plus highway was uh, built during uh, 1988 until 1994 at a cost of 7.3 billion at that time it was considered as a big big mega project because not only in terms of uh, value at that time in terms of the complexity of the project it encroached all kind of state in Malaysia with and you know uh, all state in Malaysia they do have their own uh, different administration land law because we separate state by state so it is uh, up to the state government so you just imagine the complexity of such project okay but what happened if we do have a big project so when we do have a big project meaning to say the demand is there similarly you can see now we do have what we call pan borneo project that encroach from sarawak until sabah so it is similar concept as a plus highway so that is that is a big project massive project as well so you can imagine there are a lot of manpower required yes to cater for that project so education basically being promoted uh, because of the uh, demand and then finance any big project small or big cannot be executed without money as simple as that and how basically the owner or the client or the government get the money from well they can get the money from a financial institution and where does this financial institution get the money from for sure from the public from people who want to invest etc etc 
And you know what? During this time, 1993, 1988, uh, 1988, the Plus Highway Project, uh, we know that is a big amount of money involved and they do borrow from uh, foreign sources. Because at that time, we do have bank, but our bank are not being consolidated like now. If you read the history of our bank in Malaysia, we have gone through a merger merger between a small bank into a bigger bank and i do not know now for for the one for the time being that you have seen we do have cimb we do have may bank we do have public bank that a big big project is basically due to a merger of a few bank such as cimb okay last time they they used different name they start from uh, bumi putra bank and then then again, merger, they, they changed the name into Commerce Bank, and then they changed the name into CIMB, and we never know. Uh, perhaps in the future, they will merge a few banks again. Uh, that will be the version 4.0, whatever merger. Why they do merge? Because they want to consolidate asset and fund. When you have a big money, then basically you can sponsor uh, project after project, and then the bank will make more money. If, for instance, a, a small bank, uh, they, they basically cannot uh, get a big project because bank also face a lot of risk. They also have to be supported by a bigger bank. Small bank have to be supported by a bigger bank. And if, for instance, your, uh, your, you, you are very small and not a lot of big company would like to basically take the risk, uh, so that is the concept. And nowadays, because our bank is getting bigger and bigger, and not only in Malaysia, uh, our bank, such as May Bank, Public Bank, CMB is also one of the bigger bank, biggest banks in uh, uh, Asia, in, As in Asia, for instance, because they do have a lot of uh, money uh, in the bank, so they can sponsor many, many projects. So our our project basically don't have to get money from uh, overseas. Why we do not want to get money from overseas? Because of the currency issue. If you borrow, for instance, US dollar, you never know, US dollar might go up and down. At the end of the day, we end up, we end up to pay more. That is the issue. If we just simply borrow from a local organization, so the money is just simply will circulate in Malaysia. We do not have an exchange rate, a loss, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so we can help boost our economy. And then manufacturing. So manufacturing, uh, the uh, all kind of factory that you can see. Normally, factory are being built maybe around port and airport. Why? Because they can transport the product uh, as quick as possible. And you, if you notice our manufacturing industry in Malaysia, we do cater for a global uh, product. Malaysia is one of the uh, biggest manufacturer of chips. Now we do have shortage of chip. And that chip is being used a lot in computer, in handphone, and even in car nowadays. So you notice that the car now even though we do have a tax incentive by the government, there is basically no car simply due to lack of cheap. Because car nowadays do use a lot of computer inside the engine as well. You see? And what happened when everything being, uh, uh, being crammed together at the airport and then at the port? For sure, we are not going to have a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, what we call uh, can be built there anymore because the land are so so scarce. So the manufacturing industry have to be forced to move very far, far away. And if they want to be moved very far away, then they need to have a good transportation system in order for the product to be uh, to be transported to the nearest airport and airport very quickly. So with this kind of highway infrastructure, we can basically shift the manufacturing to uh, very far away a little bit, and uh, the, the land could be cheaper, 
but then the highway is easily available, accessible, and then we can just simply transport them to the nearest airport or port as soon as possible. Similarly, uh, we do have issue with the Port Klang, for instance. If you remember, we do have a big project ECRL that connect from uh, the southern part of Malaysia, I don't know, the, the uh, eastern part of Malaysia into the west part of the Malaysia. And at one time, they wanted to save costs, uh, to save costs, and then there is a lost connection between Port Klang into the existing e e e the, the, the upcoming ECRL. Because without those things, then the transportation industry would not be able to transport things very fast. We cannot depend on our highway anymore because our highway basically is uh, only two lane each side. Now it's basically full of car plus all the truck. By right, all the goods should be transported using the railway. That would be the best alternative. If you see many, many uh, advanced nations, US for instance, uh, they use a lot of uh, railway in order to transport the product. Not to mention they still have a big, big truck, but uh, that is the issue with Malaysia. Okay, so manufacturing can be benefited by this all kind of highway. Agriculture. Okay, agriculture, if you notice, a long time ago, when the, the plus highway opened up, and then I start using the highway from northern until the southern part, you can see uh the uh what we call the left and hand side of the highway is basically full of jungle because that highway was just simply uh completed but nowadays if you travel from joho for instance the whole part of joho you can see uh, left and right hand side are full with a uh, farm plantation that is what we call uh, that cater for agriculture industry. Okay, why is it uh, easier to build very close to the highway? Because you simply can transport the product using the uh, highway to the uh, processing plant, which basically might be situated in uh, Pasir Gudang. That would be example. Okay, the rest of the highway, left and uh, right hand side, would basically full of high housing development if, if you go to KL from Seremban to KL is basically full of housing project we do have Seremban but now we do have Seremban 2 which is not uh, in Seremban anymore which is very far from Seremban but they still maintain maintain the same Seremban perhaps later on they will have the Seremban 3 Seremban 4 Seremban 5 until Seremban 100 maybe at the end of uh, uh, border between uh, Malacca, for instance. We use the same damn name anyway. So, you see, when we do have a housing project because uh, people uh, cannot buy a uh, house anymore near KL, so they can come very far away, but with the help of highway, they can travel very fast to KL, for instance, to work. Okay? And that housing project still need all kind of utilities. We need to say the water, electricity, internet connection, sewerage system, etc., etc., and uh, what not. And lastly, tourism. So, what basically construction industry or the price highway have anything to do with the tourism? Uh, that is something that we are going to go into our next slide. But before we go into the next slide, uh, we shall take a break. Yeah? We shall take uh, about five minutes break. We come back at uh, 3.45. Okay, plus, five minutes plus break. All right then. Okay, welcome back. All right, uh, I mentioned that uh, example of big projects such as uh, North and South Highway that we constructed way back in 1993, 1994, have a big impact on uh, other sectors such as tourism. In what way? Okay, now let's go back to our uh, history of uh, tourism industry in Malaysia. 
Okay, for instance, way back in 1990 until 2018, uh, 2010, for instance, we do have major, 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 major crisis, world crisis. That would be one thing. But we, Malaysia, continue uh, getting uh, so-called uh, tourist uh, arrival. And previously, tourism was not uh, considered as our source of income. We do have people from Singapore, neighboring country, Indonesia, Thailand, going back and forth. But that would not be a, a big income earner for Malaysia. Until, okay, until a few years back, tourism industry now becoming, uh, I would say around, maybe around the uh, number four uh, income as one of important income to Malaysia. But, okay, having said that, okay, let's take a look at some of the statistics. Uh, from the year 2008 until 2019, except 2020, we have seen the increase in tourist arrival. And uh, 2019, for instance, our income from uh, tourism is 86 billion. That is quite a huge number, big number, okay? But then COVID came, so COVID is like, uh, not like the other crisis that you have seen in the previous slide. This basically completely changed the situation whereby everybody get locked down in all the countries. We do not allow people to go out and in. So there is a big impact. But once uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, perhaps next year, for instance, if the COVID uh, subside, we can see the tourists coming back to Malaysia, okay? So actually, before the COVID, uh, 2020 was projected uh, income was like 100 billion. But then suddenly something happened. Okay, suddenly something happened. And uh, if you notice uh, the nature of tourists, if even you yourself want to travel to certain countries, if you have a lot of money, eh, want to travel to certain countries, but normally what could be the constraint? One of the constraints could be the timing, the time. Even though you, uh, uh, especially if you are working, you might not get a lot of leave. Your boss might not grant you leave. So you have limited uh, what we call time. That will be one thing. You might have a limited budget. You do not want to spend all the money in this kind of uh, uh, trip. You wanted to, to save money for other trip again and again, for instance. So whatever it is, you always have a limited budget, even though you are rich people, but still you normally budget for something. Okay. So that is the nature of most of the tourists. They do have limited time and limited budget. So when they go to certain country in a few days, they would like to see uh, or to, to, to take the opportunity to get many, many things done within a few uh, days, for instance. So if, for instance, last time, eh, uh, tourists normally will transit in Singapore because Singapore is like in the middle of uh, uh, everywhere, for instance. If you look at the map, uh, if you want to travel from uh, Middle East to Australia, for instance, so Singapore will be the best pit stop. Yes, in the middle. Okay. So people will basically, uh, let's say people wanted to see Singapore. So they will basically stay back a few hours or one night. But then after a few hours, they basically completed everything in Singapore. There is not much uh, thing left to see. Okay. Because not every part of Singapore you can go because uh, Sembawang, Jurong is basically industrial area. Why you want to go to that particular area anyway? Only recently they do build all kind of uh, universal uh, studio, whatever. Then you can spend more time. So what if? tourists wanted to uh, to come into Malaysia. If they have a pit stop in Singapore, then perhaps they want to spend one day uh, into Malaysia. Then they, they cross the, the border. The, the most they, they can go is within Johor Bahru. But now having the plus highway, and not to mention later on, if we do have a high speed train, they simply can go 
to Kuala Lumpur. They can go to Kuala Lumpur overnight, or if they do have two or three days, they can even go until Penang, for instance. So you see, and you know what? Don't be surprised. There are a lot of tourists come to Malaysia just for the sake of playing golf sometimes. Because playing golf in uh, Japan or even Korea is much more expensive than uh, taking a flight and staying in a hotel a few, for a few days in Malaysia. Malaysia is like heaven. It is much, much cheaper. So that's why uh, certain uh, golf course in, uh, in Johor basically do have a lot of tourists from China, even uh, Korea or Japan. Yeah, they just simply came just to play golf. You just imagine. Okay, so if the facilities uh, they can get, they can move things from one point to another point at very fast, faster speed, for instance, so they can get in many more areas. And not to mention, there are countries like Indonesia, for instance. I have been to Indonesia not many, not many times or many places, just one or two places. Indonesia basically uh, do have a lot of uh, beautiful places that you can see. But unfortunately, the issue with the infrastructure and the issue with uh, what we call machet or jam, they, they do have a lot of people there. So you cannot move very fast. Sometime if you go to one place, it will take you the whole day. Not much to be seen unless you spend a longer period of time. You see, the infrastructure do play a very important part. Okay, Once we do have uh, everything connected, uh, highways and then uh, railways that basically will uh, promote uh, a lot more tourism this is the example and if you look at this slide uh, this slide was way back in 2016 uh, malaysia was considered as one of the top 10 tourist destination in the world only now we fall into uh, maybe 12 or 13 places but still a uh, very good uh, uh, achievement compared to uh, many, many countries where we thought that they might have uh, better facilities, but you never know, okay? And Asia most visited country. You see, number one is China and then Thailand and Malaysia. So, it is, so tourism industry is very important. It should be well supported by a good infrastructure. We do have a lot of uh, beautiful places, but unfortunately, when you go to some of the places, are very very hard to get uh, into, and then the facility even uh, at that particular spot might not be well developed. Okay, so that basically need uh, a lot of uh, investment, and the investment will go into the construction industry. Okay, in terms of city. You see, Kuala Lumpur is always listed as a top 10 city where people would like to go, okay, for whatever reason. And uh, for Muslim uh, tourists, Kuala Lumpur is always one of the favorite places, okay. Uh, we cannot beat Mecca, Medina, whatever, but then uh, people go there for, for simply one purpose, but uh, Kuala Lumpur basically for many, many uh, other purposes. All right. And then construction economy okay in order to understand the importance of construction construction uh, growth or uh, to with regard to our economy we need to understand a few things the so-called economic indicator so one of the thing uh, we call it gdp okay, gdp where is that thing well i cannot write down this thing GDP. Okay, never mind. Okay, GDP. So what is GDP stand for? Gross domestic product. Okay, gross domestic domestic product is the indicator of an economy. Anywhere in the world, uh, if you want to know the health of the economy, people will talk with regard to GDP. It is like if you want to know you are healthy or not. The first thing that people measure is basically your temperature. So it is the same concept. So what inside the GDP? GDP consists of a few things that, that uh, basically contribute to the whole uh, amount of GDP. First, C. C is basically consumer spending. 
meaning to say if we as a consumer we do not keep our money inside the bank we do spend so that means the economy is uh, is basically running then i i is basically what investment made by industry industry basically uh, do invest in order to open up new factory uh, new housing new mall new whatever things so they input money and then the economy again booming e e is the excess of export over import this is what we call trade balance so our country do export things and also do import things we export things like uh, palm oil uh, uh, electronics thing and etc etc but we do import even we do import rice because we do have insufficient amount of rice okay and then we do import um, a lot of food product for for animal for instance we, because we do not have uh, sufficient manufacturing of that and etc but in term of what we call uh, uh, this thing import over export yeah we want the uh, uh, we we want to export more okay we want to export more compared to uh, to uh, what we call import so in that situation you have a trade balance okay you have a trade balance so which is good and then lastly uh, g g is basically government spending government spending uh, meaning to say how much money that government spend on on annual budget so if you add all those things together that will contribute gdp and in terms of gdp it is normally being uh, uh being uh being mentioned in terms of percentage what does percentage mean okay let's say how much is gdp if you add up uh, C plus I plus E plus G, that would uh, that would end up to be around 1.4 trillion. That is how big is our GDP. Okay, 1.4 trillion. That is the amount. Okay, let's say uh, for this year we spend 1.45. Uh, for next year we spend 1.5. You see, you take the difference between those two and divide it back by the original value you will get the percentage so the economy the gdp growth is in terms of percentage so if the percentage is positive meaning to say it is a good meaning to say that there is a expansion of economy but how about if it is negative now we are experiencing negative uh, contraction of economy why because we simply cannot spend even though we do government do allocate uh, money uh, for the construction industry but due to covid construction uh, was being stopped so there is no work when there is no work there is no uh, no money spent uh, as easy as that similarly when we do have lockdown people cannot travel when people do not travel people do not spend money on uh, gas petroleum uh, people do not spend money on hotel people do not spend money on uh, food etc etc so you can see the the the, the money is being uh, being cut down from the original spending okay so that is the situation so the economic indicator normally being uh, mentioned in terms of gdp growth and perhaps you can see from this graph uh, a few years just to take a few years 2017 until 2000 uh, 2020, you can see a big uh, dump, uh, slight dump, or not a big dump in terms of percentage of GDP due to the COVID. But whatever it is, whatever it is, the good thing is that when we do have a sluggish economy, in just a matter of a few years, it will go back. Because that is what we call the cycle of economy. It will not be staying uh, at the lowest point there for many, many years. because uh, people will 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 be will creative enough to to stimulate the economy in many many ways. Okay, next. All right. So uh, this is not. This is uh, uh, okay. You can see uh, almost all sector economic sector during COVID basically have negative 
uh, growth. Yeah, what to do? And it is not happening in Malaysia, but if you compare the uh, the figure with almost all countries, even uh, country like Singapore, also have experienced the same things. Okay, uh, GDP is one thing. Remember, GDP is around one point four trillion. But how about the economy, Malaysian economy? How big is our economy? In this world, you can just simply Google uh, biggest economy in the world. Number one, uh, still the champion is uh, uh, US. Number two, for a very long, long time, uh, basically Japan was the second biggest economy. But now China has taken over. So number two will be China. Number three will be Japan. So just imagine Japan is not a big, big country, but in terms of economy, it is basically four under second or third. Just imagine. And if you want to know how big is the country economy, you can take a look at the product that you use. If the product of that nation is in every home in the world, meaning to say the economy of that country must be very big. So that's how a certain country getting richer and richer due to the fact that uh, they produce certain product and the product is being uh, purchased by everywhere in the world. Last time, uh, for instance, Japan. Japan, very good at producing electronic and even car. So everywhere you go in the world, people will use uh, Sony television, long time ago, huh? uh, and Toyota car, Honda car, compared to certain, certain country. Okay, so that would be the uh, our economy, and uh, what else? Okay, this is an example. If you notice that a few years, uh, our GDP from 1996 until 2020, we can see up and down, up and down, and you can you can almost see the pattern between the year 2000, year 1999. What is this? 1985, and then the year uh, 2008, 1998, 2008, and then uh, 2020. You can see almost a, a cyclic pattern. And people in, uh, if you study economy, you already know the economy is going to to uh, to sluggish or uh, boom. But except that you you might not expect whatever, what could be the event that trigger either the economy is going to be at the sluggish point or uh, at the booming point. Okay, but in reality, that is the pattern. If you put all the country in the world and you draw the GDP of that country into a graph, you can see almost similar pattern. There will be up and down of the economy, okay? And from this uh, diagram, you can see almost all the industry in Malaysia has experienced uh, negative uh, growth. Uh, if we compare uh, year 2020 and 2021. Construction, for instance, where is construction? Uh, negative 13.3, 13.9 in the quarter of, meaning to say uh, last, uh, last year. Okay, 2020, but uh, at the beginning of this year, 2021, uh, we can still see the negative growth, but it is being reduced a little bit. But almost all the sector basically do experience those kind of contraction. Okay, now next. Uh, okay, what else that I want to say? Gross national saving. Okay, I just want to show you something. Where is that thing? Okay, construction. Okay, you can see the construction contribution in the economy is around 4%. Uh, perhaps this will answer the question. Previously, I, even in this slide, also 4%. We, we can say that construction is very important sector. I pose a question to you. If it is very important sector, how come construction share to the economy is only around 4 to 5%? It's very small. By right, it should be like 40%. Then that statement basically could be valid. Ah, that is the issue. Okay. 
Now, this slide simply show on the right hand side of the slide, show us a few things. Uh, the, the value could be, uh, uh, this is the value of 2017, but it's almost there. Yearly, yearly in Malaysia, we do spend around 200 billion ringgit uh, money uh, in the construction industry, 200 billion. So that's why when you calculate 200 billion out of 1.4 trillion, so it end up to be around 4%, not much compared to uh, other sector, okay? That would be the fact. And then how much uh, salary being paid? Okay, uh, in terms of how many, how many people uh, uh, being employed in the construction industry? We do employ around 1.3 million people in the construction industry. 1.3 million. Okay, 1.3 million. And I would say 10% would be 10% uh, would be considered as professional people. The rest are construction workers. And how much money being paid as a salary? Almost 40 billion. So 1.3 billion get employed. So 40 billion ringgit are being paid as salary. So meaning to say construction do contribute in terms of the employment even though in terms of value might not be uh, big, 4%, but in terms of contribution to the whole industry, it can act as what we call catalyst. Catalyst. Okay, remember way back, maybe we do have uh, another, uh, another slide. Okay, I will explain into, uh, in another slide. But now I want to go into what we call... Uh, we, I already mentioned about GDP, one thing, 1.4 trillion. Uh, eco, um, our economy is about 2 trillion. But now come the budget. Okay, budget. All right. So, uh, this coming uh, 29 October, we are going to listen to uh, the next budget for the year 2022. And for this year budget, uh, we have seen uh, what we call a bloated budget. Bloated budget meaning to say the biggest budget ever uh, from our history. Previously, our budget was uh, not as big as this. But because of COVID, uh, some of the money had to be spent uh, into uh, uh, hospitalization, vaccine, etc., etc., and to help uh, people. And when you take a look at the budget being released in uh, coming 29 October, so the one that you should focus is on this development budget. Okay, development budget. What does development budget mean? De development budget, basically, this is what we call uh, the government will spend 69 billion. Okay, government will spend 69 billion into a, a public related project. This is government spending. And remember, the equation that we mentioned before, why uh, GDP equivalent to what? GDP equivalent to C, consumer spending, investment, uh, export over ex import, and then G. G is what we call government spending. So government spending is through what we call uh, budget. This is what we call federal government budget. In Malaysia, we do have federal government and then we do have a uh, state government. State government also will, will come up with their own budget and some of the money will basically spend on uh, certain development as well. So the whole federal budget is basically that will, will be spent on the entire Malaysia, for instance, 69 billion. So meaning to say government will spend 69 billion. But in terms of our annual spending for the construction, it, I mentioned to you is 200 billion. So where basically the rest come from? The rest basically coming from the private sector. Ah, the private sector. Okay, I would say that private sector basically spend more than the government. Uh, and then when they total up, it would be like almost 200 billion. And that 200 billion depend on uh, the project that government is doing. Currently, we do have a big, big project going on. For instance, LRT3, 
MRT project in KL, and then we do have uh, some highway project uh, still going on, and then we do have a uh, double track double tracking railway going on from uh, Gemas to Southern Johor. And then we do have ECRL going on. So when they, we do have a big, big, big mega project. So basically uh, the spending for the construction industry would basically uh, very high, okay? Would be very high. And that would be a good thing. Why? Because I mean, that simply tell that we are going to survive. When you graduate, meaning to say there are jobs waiting for you, for sure. Because there are a lot of uh, money allocated for project, so they need all the people. Okay, Either you could be working with the uh, government project or even the private sector project. Okay. Okay, you see, uh, in the year 2020, government only spent around 56 billion. But uh, in 2021, the government allocate more, 69 billion. But unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, some of the money basically cannot be spent because the construction basically stopped work for a few months, cannot be spent. And the good thing is that the money will be, uh, will be overflow into the next year. So that is uh, yet to be seen in this uh, 29 October budget. Okay. So as uh, engineer, so you should be aware of those kind of thing because those kind of thing will uh, will basically tell us indicator whether construction is going to be booming or not. Okay. Don't just simply look at the figure and just simply don't have any appreciation. By right, uh, you university student, civil engineering student uh, should have more knowledge, not just simply uh, things that uh, you can be used as a design or whatever. No, 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 no. Construction industry is bigger than what you, you, you think. Okay. And I see, again, uh, Malaysian GDP do have up and down. Okay. So there is nothing uh, to worry because uh, that is part and parcel of the uh, economic cycle. But as a person, when you start working, you need to be prepared. Prepare in terms of what? Don't spend all the money that you have. Uh, you finish up uh, during that month or that year. You need to have some kind of saving. Because naturally, economy is going to contract within a certain cycle. I would say maybe around, some people say around 10 years. That will be the 10 year cycle. So every 10 year, we are going to see the, the down of economy and except uh, for this particular COVID, nobody can predict that COVID uh, has a very much impact. People thought that COVID is just going to last for a few months only, but nobody expect that it's going to last few years. Now we already encroach into two years, we never know, okay? So, okay, this is just a plotting you can get over the internet. Uh, if we plot the uh, GDP growth of the country, you can see these kind of things. And you know what? Uh, the, the sluggish point basically relate to certain, certain major event that happen not only to Malaysia, but global. And uh, the economy is basically predicted that we are going to rebound. So now we are in, uh, in uh, already in uh, October. So you see, you can see the economy is now picking up bit by bit. When we start to open up the economy and you can see uh, people start uh, spending money again, people do have money saving, but because the economy get uh, locked down, they basically, they, they basically uh, stop spending. In major crisis that we have encountered throughout the uh, this period, we can see that when uh, when uh, when we encounter economic crisis, people basically afraid to spend money. They do have money in the bank, but they simply do not want to spend because they never know what is going to happen. Maybe they got laid off uh, by tomorrow, so you better keep the money. When people do not spend the money, so the economy is basically get stuck. That is not good uh, for the economy. So that's why government. Uh, giving money as a, a, a what we call um, 
as an assistant because the government know when government give uh, poor people money, they basically will spend the, man, the money almost instantly. They are not going to keep the money anyway. So that how to kickstart the economy. All right, then. Okay, now we come into uh, almost the end of uh, this slide by looking at this particular slide. Okay, this particular, uh, particular, particular slide basically comprises of three graphs. The blue, uh, green, and the red one. So if you read this graph, I'm not really sure, you must be able to interpret what does this thing tell us. So this the thing basically tells us a few things. First thing first, uh, I do not have the whole uh, du entire duration uh, period from 1980s and then uh, 2020, but you can basically relate to the previous slide uh, because all the figure basically add up to the uh, until current situation. But I just want to uh, to mention the, 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 the idea behind this graph that we can learn. Okay, first thing first, the blue one. The blue one is the, this graph indicate our economy GDP, nation GDP that is up and down. Let's focus on the down uh, period, 1985. This is what we call consider as recession. You were not born yet, okay? Uh, this recession due to global recession. So during this time, it's the same situation that we face where people who graduate from university simply have no job. Economy, economy basically uh, sluggish. But then a few years after that, you see, the economy already rebound. Rebound and the period of 1980, 1988 until 1996, for instance, is the best period that we experienced. If you remember, this is when we uh, constructed uh, Plus Highway, KLIA1, uh, Commonwealth Game, uh, Village and Stadium, etc., etc., where the big, big project going on at that particular time. That's why our GDP even encroached into double digit growth. But then suddenly in 1998, we experienced what we call ASEAN, ASEAN financial crisis, where our money basically being dumped and uh, get into the lowest uh, point, exchange rate or well, the worst situation and the interest rate was, was being uh, up and then at this situation, a few uh, ASEAN countries, Malaysia or even Southeast Asian country being affected due to uh, speculation of the uh, currency. But then we rebound back, rebound back and then uh, go into the positive mode again until 2008. So you see between 1998 and 2008, it's almost 10 years. Between 1998 and 1985 is uh, 12 years, for instance. So it is, the cycle is almost like that. And now we, we experience uh, the COVID is in the year 2019. So it's almost one, uh, 10 years, okay? uh, which we never expect. But we are going to rebound. So, and the way we read this thing, uh, first thing is that we cannot uh there is nothing that can avoid the economy from being down this is like uh, god creation there is up and down it is like a cycle so you just need to be prepared okay that would be one thing and the second thing that we want to relate when the economy is down just take a look at the red graph red color graph this reflect the construction growth the construction is normally the most affected sector. If you compare to any other sector, the construction normally will be the most affected. And you see why the graph looks much, much, and the value looks much, much bigger because when you take the construction sector, maybe worth uh, 200 uh, billion ringgit, compare with the yearly spending, then you can do the plotting. Okay, it is not as big as uh, the economy. 
but then you can see the the construction sector would be much affected uh, when the economic is down and then when the economic is up that is the nature of the construction economy so that's why we say construction economy and uh, construction industry is very much related to the economy of any of any nation and then uh let's take a look at 2009 it looks like the economy is down but then the construction industry is not uh, down as much as we would see the economy is down by negative 6.2 but then the, the construction is only 0 0.6 was supposed to be down much bigger than that what happened actually ah this is this is what we call lesson learned all the nation uh, all the nation everywhere in the world basically learn one thing out of the asian financial crisis you know what do they learn don't overreact okay don't overreact in terms of you cut spending you stop spending etc etc and you will you will make the matter worse what happened is that you the government have to keep spending to release all the reserve that the country have any country basically do have reserve uh, and the country like Singapore basically do have a lot of reserve. We Malaysia also have some kind of reserve. Okay, so use that money in order to help uh, the people or industry. And during 2009, what happened is that because of the issue with the U.S. government, U.S. having uh, what we call a mortgage issue. When U.S. are being affected, the whole nation will be affected. Why? Because uh, most of the country do have a trade uh, in U.S. U U.S. basically do buy all the things from uh, anywhere. So that's why if you go to U.S., you can buy things at cheaper price. Okay, why? Because U.S. do buy from a third country like us, for instance. And they do sell at according to whatever rate that they have. So during that time, what happened is that many, many, many country release what we call stimulus package. So that is a specific name. We call it stimulus package. And you know what? During the COVID situation, you will hear that terminology again and again. We in Malaysia have released many, many stimulus package uh, even during this COVID uh, situation and during 2009 what happens is that government release not only Malaysian government Singapore government Japan government China government all over the world uh, release uh, money from their own uh, reserve and you know what one of the sector that government uh, do allocate money is the construction industry and during that time government uh, release a project Maybe the project was not uh, supposed to be due yet, but uh, the government basically allocate money to do the construction of a school project and many, many things. The, the public uh, infrastructure project in order to spend the money. When you spend the money on construction, again, remember, construction will be a catalyst to 124 other industries. So that's how you keep up the economy. So that's why. I mentioned to you, construction is a very important economy to our nation. And lastly, the last graph. Okay, the last graph is basically we call it uh, the green one. The construction contribution. Remember, we uh, nowadays yearly we do spend around two hundred billion ringgit to construct whatever thing that we need to construct. And if you look at the graph, the graph tells us not much that we spend on construction with regard to our economy. Only by looking, looking at the value is only from 3 to 5%, I would say. So 3 to 5% is not, is not big compared to manufacturing, compared to service. So how do you read this uh, value, basically? How do you read this value in terms of it contribution to the construction industry okay if you look at the uh, do we have any figures that can okay for instance 
from the year 1960 until 2010, for instance, we can see that uh, other industry, uh, for instance, manufacturing, it grow from 8.7 until 32. So that is a big growth. But how about construction? Even service also grow bigger and bigger. Construction basically remain, uh, remain in the range of 3 to 5%. So meaning to say, not much improvement in terms of construction industry growth. So having said that, that is a good thing. You know why? If you compare that to other developed nations, we in Malaysia, we, we categorize our country as a developing nation. Country like uh, Korea, Japan, uh, US, and some of the European nations, even Singapore, they consider themselves as a developed nation, so advanced nation. So we are in the middle. There are some country under developed nation. Okay. So if you compare GDP in a developed nation, the contribution to the uh, economy for the construction industry is much bigger, maybe nine to 10% compared to us. So meaning to say, we have a lot of potential to grow. So meaning to say, we do have a lot of uh, construction to be, to, be, to, be, to be made. Just imagine, what are the characteristics of developed nation? Developed nation, if you look at developed nation, normally, let, let's, stay, let's take a look at the school system. Developed nation normally do have a one session of school, one school session. In Malaysia, we do have how many school session? We do have morning session, we do have evening session, and even we do have night session, also tuition. Eh? You will learn uh, 24 hours, but the level of uh, intelligence still remain the same. Eh? Okay, so at least we do have two sessions. Why do we do have two sessions? Simply because we do not have sufficient or enough school. In order to have one session, meaning to say we need to have all many, many schools operated at the same time. Then only we can do one session, meaning to say people, a student go to school early in the morning and then they will go back in the evening, just one session. They don't have to rush. Uh, the school bus don't have to do many, many trips to, to bring people up and down because of many sessions. So a lot of time will be wasted because of the traffic jam, because of the uh, people, parents have to go and pick up a uh, student because they do have different sessions. It's just a complete waste of time. By right, children should, should learn in the morning until late afternoon session. And then they go back and then they do have some time to play in the evening and then they rest and then at night they basically review a little bit and then they go to bed early that should be the way so nowadays because of the system children basically don't have time to play and so, so that that's why they play during the, uh, the classroom and then they sleep during the classroom because they do not have uh, sufficient time to rest for instance okay so the good thing is that our economy, uh, our construction industry still have a big room for improvement. That is a good thing. And then second thing is that, meaning to say, once they have a lot room to, to, to improve, meaning to say you can rest assured that your career will be, will be sustainable even for the, for the next 10, 20, or even 30 years. Because we still have a long way to go if we want to achieve like nine to ten percent of uh, construction contribution to the economy so we can uh, so meaning to say you are not choosing the 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 the, the worst career in in the life eh? if you if you go to one of the website we call it um, uh, talent Corp talent corporation malaysia talent corporation there is one publication that lists critical job in Malaysia. And you know what? Jobs such as a project management, a project manager, construction manager, manager, and even uh, engineer, civil engineer, not only civil engineer, all kind of engineer still being considered as a critical job. People need those jobs in the next 10, 20, or even 30 years. Okay? So, all right. 
And then uh, lastly, what else? Okay, you can basically uh, Google, uh, go to YouTube. There are a lot of mega projects in Malaysia. So those kind of mega projects will contribute to the, uh, 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 to the job uh, in the next uh, uh, five or 10 years, whatever. And remember, in Malaysia, we do have a five-year plan. Recently, government just released a 12 a Malaysia plan and government plan to spend around 400 billion in the next five years. So that 400 billion will be translate. Some of the money will be going into construction industry. So be happy, rest assured that the job is basically waiting for you, except it depends. Eh? Some people will get job much faster. Uh, people, yeah, because as a owner of the company, people would like to choose the best. So if you, you uh, basically, you have uh, learned and then it translates into your CGPA with higher CGPA and you can uh, be happy that the job is waiting for you. Okay, but not to say that people who less uh, CGPA will not get any job, but because there are a requirement. If, for instance, you are working in the uh, at construction site, there are many companies who do not like to, to, to get a high achiever. People do not like to, 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 to hire people with high pointer. You know why? High pointer people, CG, high, uh, people with high CGPA, normally they work like a robot. Uh, they are not um, well-rounded. They do not have a well-rounded personality. They normally do things only one. Uh, that is not good for uh, in, in the area of uh, project management, construction management, or even site management, where we need all rounded uh, personality. You see, so every place basically do uh, do require different type of personality. So it depends. Okay, so with that, uh, we uh, just before we end up uh, the first slide because we are going to take a break. Just want to share with you uh, how big is the American uh, economy compared to Malaysian economy. Remember, in terms of budget, okay, in terms of budget, our budget is around uh, 322 billion ringgit. 232 billion ringgit, if you convert to US dollar is uh, how much? Huh? Very, very, very little. It is like maybe 50 US dollar and 50 billion US dollar. Whereas US government spend 3.9 trillion US dollar for the budget alone. And unfortunately, because the American uh, uh, basically do act as a, a world police, they basically spend a lot of money on uh, military. Okay, you notice, huh? maybe one third of their spending is on military and they do have a lot of debt as well, okay, that they need to finish. So that is the issue. All right, so with that, uh, we are going to end up this uh, slide and we shall take uh, about 10 minute break before we go into our next uh, slide, okay? So we take uh, about 10 minute break.